Okay. Let's go with Ezekiel 1. Let's just start from the beginning. Let's have some fun. And uh, we'll do Ezekiel 2. And maybe we'll touch on some of Ezekiel 3. Why not? Why not? Why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all this fun. All this fun. And, uh, yeah. And the thing to remember when we read this is wherever your imagination goes, just go with it. You know, just, you know. It's, it's apocalyptic language. And Ezekiel is about to see something and it's described in ways where your imagination should be a little bit childlike. <laughs> um, whatever you do, try your best not to Google what this image looks like <laughs> because it doesn't make any sense. Can and again, it's because, that no, watch the video. Yeah, oh, because, it, <laughs> because it's, it's, it's using language to try to depict something like what an angel saw. And so when you see the picture that people paint and draw, you just see all these funny rainbows everywhere and kind of wheels spinning and, you know, eyes, eyes everywhere. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. So anyway, let's have some fun from verse one. And, um, and in fact, there is a psalm and I cannot remember the psalm, but it is, um, then someone might have a Bible reference or can Google about um, singing by the uh, Chiba Canal and it's a psalm. It's a psalm, in fact, if we find it, then we will read that as well. Um, anyway, in the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the Chiba Canal, Chiba, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God or visions from God. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim. And so here is Ezekiel in the 30th year. So Ezekiel here is 30. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest. And, uh, and why is he 30? Because in your Old Testament, you have to be 30 to be a priest. Why does Jesus' ministry start when he's 30? Because he is the last priest. And so he has to be 30. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, the son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans by the Chiba Canal. And the hand of the Lord was upon him there. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north and a great cloud with brightness around it and fire lashing forth continually and in the midst of the fire as it were gleaming metal or amber and from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures and this was their appearance they had a human likeness but each had four faces and each of them had four wings their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. And the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight forward, without turning as they went. Just going to pause there to say something quite interesting. And I don't have a picture, so you may need to Google this. <laughs> In your tabernacle, you have the Ark of the Covenant where there are cherubim on it and their wings touch. So here we have. Um, Ezekiel seeing angelic figures with their wings touching. Verse 10, as for the likeness of their faces, they each had a human face. The four had the face 
The four had, a, had the face of a lion on the right side. The four had the face of an ox on the left side. The four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. So we have lion, ox, eagle. Does that represent Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Could well do. There's four gospels. Could this somehow represent Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Because as we as we go as we keep reading, I think there is another face as well. Um, it could well do. Let me just cut, let me just continue reading for a minute, and then we'll come back to this though, and I'll tell you. Um, some theologians and the position they take on this and I, 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 I like it I like it a lot such were their faces and their wings were spread out above each creature had two wings each of which touched the wing of another while they covered their bodies and each went straight forward wherever the spirit would go they went without turning as they went as for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like the burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. And the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning, and the living creatures darted to and fro like the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures, one for each of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of beryl. And the four had the same likeness, their appearance and construction being as it were a wheel, a wheel within a wheel. When they, where, when they went, they went in any of their four <coughs> directions, without turn as they went. And their rims were tall and awesome, and the rims of all four were full of eyes all around. And when the living creatures went out, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose. Wherever the Spirit wanted to go, they went, and the wheels rose along with them, for the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those went, these went, and when those stood, these stood, and when those from... When those rose from the earth, the wheels rose along with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Okay, are we nice and confused yet? Yep, yeah, good, that's good. Over the heads of the living creatures there was the likeness of an expanse, shining like awe-inspiring crystal, spread out above their heads. And under the expanse their wings were stretched out straight, one toward another. And each creature had two wings covering its body. And when, and when they went, I heard the sound of their wings, like the sound of many waters, like the sound of the Almighty, a sound of tumult, like the sound of an army. When they stood still, they let down their wings, and there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads. When they stood still, they let down their wings. And above the expanse over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne, in the appearance of sapphire and seated above the likeness of a, of a throne was a likeness with a human appearance and upward from what had the appearance of his waist i saw as it were gleaming metal like the appearance of fire enclosed all around and downward from what had the appearance of his waist i saw as it were the appearance of fire and there was brightness around him, like the appearance of the bow, the rainbow, that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I, Ezekiel, saw this, I fell on my face, and I heard the voice of one speaking. Now, <laughs> After we've just read all of that, initial thoughts or feelings? <laughs> Apart from what is going on. <laughs> well, I can understand why he fell on his face. You can understand why he, he fell, fell on his on face. His face yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Hide me. <laughs> yes, I don't want to see him. It's <laughs> <That's> crazy. <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> yeah. 
anything else? Psalm 137 comes around at a time where we have a, a, a nice connection to the circumstances happening at the beginning of Ezekiel. At the beginning of Ezekiel, Ezekiel in these first opening chapters is being commissioned. He is being ordained by the Lord to become a prophet. And that's very interesting because Ezekiel is told in verse 3 we're told about Ezekiel in verse 3 the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest well Ezekiel is not going to be a priest he is in exile he has been taken and Nebuchadnezzar has come and he has gone out with the first groupings so he's not by the temple in other words, when, as Tim says, when we read about these words, the, the Chebar Canal or Chebar Canal and the land of the Chaldeans, we're back into Babylon. We're back into Babylon. So we're not in Jerusalem anymore. Ezekiel is taken, no, Jerusalem, Jerusalem here, <laughs> picked up, we back over. So Ezekiel is over here. As if he was in Babylon somewhere. He's nowhere near the temple. Nowhere near. And and he's a priest. And he's like, right, it's about time for me start to start my priestly ministry. <laughs> and priests got treated quite well. Um, you know. Prophets, on the other hand, got treated badly. And Ezekiel was about to become a prophet. And he's like, uh ah. -uh. <laughs> and God's like, you're about to be my prophet, mate. And that comes about in chapter 2. But the opening of Ezekiel chapter 1, the first three verses, set the scene. There I am, I'm amongst the exiles by the canal. And Psalm 137 reads, By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, we hung up our stringed instruments. We hung up our harps. For there our captors required of us songs, our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing, sing to us one of your songs of Zion. Come on, sing. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? 
If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. That's a, that's a stunning verse. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. In other words, if I forget to worship the Lord and the Lord only, if it's not possible to worship you, Lord, anymore, then take away everything I know. Take away everything I know. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy, remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, how they said, lay it bare, lay it bare, down to its foundations. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. So, heavy stuff is the psalm. The psalm is, if you're going to come in and destroy God's children, then may God repay. And here Ezekiel is saying, there I am, I'm a priest, I'm by the river, there we all are, we're exiles, it's doom and gloom, and he then has a vision. And as it says there, the... The end of verse 3, um, I don't know what other translations read, but mine says, um, The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans, by the Chaber Canal, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. And the hand of the Lord is upon him there, and throughout the book of Ezekiel you'll see time and time again this concept of the hand of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord, Taking, a, taking a v Ezekiel back to Jerusalem to see things. It's rather, you know, incredible. But to start the entire prophetic ministry and commissioning of Ezekiel, he sees this glorious glory of the Lord. And there's language in here that we're going to see uh, in Revelation. We're going to see it in Revelation. And uh, we've, we've seen it in Revelation, but uh, it's, it's right there. And Jackie made a good point right from the get-go. Just look back at verse 10. Verse 10. Um, they have wings. They appear to have human hands. Their wings are touching. They're kind of they're going... You know, are they going out to the four corners of the whole world? In one sense, yes. The whole of the text, the whole of the chapter tells you that kind of they're, they're, they're an angelic army, you know, but also there's these representatives. And verse 10 tells you, as, as for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion, an ox, an eagle. And so you have this concept, and then later on in the chapter as well, right at the end, it has um, verse 26, and seated above the likeness of a throne was the likeness of a human appearance. So you have these four descriptions of human, ox, lion, and eagle. And some theologians, James B. Jordan, Peter Lightheart, being the ones predominantly who are the ones who um, uh, see these links, turn around and say, this is really interesting. Could they be the four Gospels? Possibly, they, they may well be. But, I don't know enough on that. But where we're at in the history of the writing of Ezekiel is Ezekiel's priest and then there's two other titles that I keep banging on about that Adam was in the garden he is a something 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 <clears throat> prophet, priest and king okay so Adam is the first prophet, priest, and king. Adam is told, 
to have dominion, kingship. He is to intercede, priest, and he is to be prophetic, to tell the woman and to tell his children what the Lord's expectations are. He's the first prophet, priest, and king. And as you look at these descriptions here of an ox, a lion, and an eagle, some theologians out there have suggested that your Old Testament can be broken down into these descriptions. An ox is the priest, a priestly rule. A priestly domain sacrifice don't bring me a blemished sacrifice bring me something that is correct something unspotted the next you have is uh, a lion and you go okay you've got an ox you've got a lion what's the lion represent kings, lions, the idea of power, the idea of dominion, um, you know, some kings, and finally you have eagle, finally you have eagle, and eagle is the idea of prophets, the idea of the word spreading. And it's a very interesting thing, because we say for ease, Adam or Jesus, prophet, priest and king. But in a funny kind of way, in the Garden of Eden scene, Adam is told to have dominion first. He's a king. He is told to guard and to keep everything in the garden. So he's an intercessor. And the very last thing you see is that he gets a beloved who then he's supposed to prophesy to to be prophetic to. Has the Lord really said? Yes, this is what the Lord really said. This is how we're to be. And in our order here, you have, I saw one with a human face, and then he goes, lion, ox, eagle. And so this idea, or the idea being, that Ezekiel sees all of these figures that are representing the whole of the constitution of prophet, priest, and king. And how is it all wrapped up? Into one person. And obviously we know that, we go to the back of our books for the homework answers. <laughs> As a good textbook student, you do that with your English or your maths, what's the answer? Go to the back. Jesus Christ is the king, priest, prophet. He is the king, priest, prophet. And how do you and I know all of that? Well, the Great Commission is very straightforward. Jesus came and said, All authority, King, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of the nations, <coughs> baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Holy and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. Ah. King prophet priest, king, priest, prophet. And so Ezekiel here sees all of these angelic, this angelic figure that represents an ark, the ark of the covenant. And the wings touch and Ezekiel is blown away by the glory. We've mentioned eyes all around. Notice again verse 12, I don't know what verse 12 says. Um, for you, but it says, and each way went straight forward wherever the Spirit would go. So this angelic host is not just doing whatever it wants to do. Again, the language here is, is about glory, and again, the silent part of the Trinity is still here, and the Spirit is the one directing, He is the conductor of this choir. Incredible. Wherever they went. As it goes on, as for the likeness of the living creatures, they were like burning coals of fire. 
their appearance of torture moving to and fro like living creatures. And the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. All of this language of fire, of lightning, of burning is all there for glory. Is all there for refinement. Like all of this language again should get our spidey senses tingling when you go back to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Just, you know, in the year that King Uzziah died, I, Isaiah, saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, where well, we have that in Ezekiel, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, and two covered his face, two covered his feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Well, smoke comes from fire. You don't get smoke. You know, it's from fire. All the language is fire here. Where are we? We're in the temple. And again, what is Isaiah seeing? The Lord sitting on his throne in his holy temple. Oh, okay. So there's smoke. And I said, uh-oh. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I'm in trouble. Woe is me, for I am lost. What am I doing here? For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the lords of hosts. Yes, I've seen the great general. I've seen God. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, and having in his hand a soft pillow. No. He comes along with a burning coal, and you go, what are you going to do with that? Well, don't you worry yourself, I thought. <laughs> Where's that burning coal going? You know. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs. <laughs> that it's so hot <laughs> that the, even the seraphim the angelic being can't touch it he gets tongs from the altar and he touches the lips of Isaiah and says behold this has touched your lips your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for and as I sit in there with these great big swollen burnt lips now going thanks guys that here, thanks yeah it's all about fire. It's all about glory. It's all about, you know, power <coughs> and worship. And it's just just incredible that Ezekiel here is seeing this and he's like, what in the world? <laughs> I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble because I'm seeing the glory of God and I'm seeing him in, this, in all of this lovely, wonderful, glorious language with these angels, this tabernacle, Ark of the Covenant scene, and they, they all have an appearance, verse 16, these wheels and all of these wheels, and they're all shining. They're all shining diamonds. They're all shining stones. And we like all of, we like shining stones, because stones reflect light. And you look at stones and diamonds and you, if you look hard enough, people will get them out and you can see dazzling light. Little moment captures of fire in them. Their appearance being like the will. And there they are. And what are they about to do? Well, as it goes on, um, they are carrying the throne of God, ultimately, ultimately. And verse 22 goes on, and this is even, this is even more stunning, because where we're going to go is we're going to end up in Revelation, but I will pause in a minute to, to take a breath for anyone to, or interrupt now. Um, but verse 22 goes on to say, over the heads of the living creatures. Okay, so Ezekiel's there. He sees all of this wonder and he's like, uh oh, 
And then above their heads, he sees what he calls an expanse. Shining like awe-inspiring crystal. In other words, he sees what we call the firmament. And the firmament is basically what we would say. You look up into the sky and you go, okay, so we humans know that if we go, keep going up and up and up and up and up and up, eventually we end up in space because we have gone through the firmament. Well, here we have there being an expanse, the firmament, if you will, of God, then the expanse, the firmament, then the angelic beings, and then Ezekiel. And the firmament here is the separation between God and his creation. In other words, between what is holy, 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 and what is not. And it's very important because where we're going to go in Revelation, you're going to see that John is taken up and he is now the opposite side of the x man he's, he's, he's in the throne room of God in the book of Revelation. He is in headquarters. He is there in the planning room. He's in God's throne room. And it's all possible because Jesus Christ cleanses, cleanses, in fact, let me just, let us just read that verse um, in Hebrews 9. Because this is a, this is a, such an important verse. Um, and, and, and something that actually is <laughs> just mind-blowing, really. Just mind blowing. What I'm what I'm about to say is what's mind blowing about Hebrews nine. Slight tangent. I appreciate that. Is the <coughs> the potency and the power and the glory of Christ's blood. Yeah. That is what's at stake. Does Christ's blood really cleanse sinners? And Hebrews 9 just turns around and says, yep. <laughs> yep. But just read with me from... Mm, 15. We'll start with 15. No, we'll start from 11. We'll start with 11. We'll start with 11. We will start with 11. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. Okay, notice that. Heaven. Nothing made down here on earth. Nothing made heavenly. Not the tabernacle, not the temple, nothing. Greater and more perfect tense. When Christ appeared as the high priest, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh here on earth, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And you go, okay, good, okay. So we're talking about being regenerated. Perfect, okay. Is that it? Is that all you've got to say? No, 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 no. He goes on. Therefore, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. 
For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop. This is, as, this is Exodus 24. And he sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. What did he sprinkle them with? With blood. Saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God has commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. There's no forgiveness. Then he goes on. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things. So heavenly things, earthly things. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things, things here on earth, to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves, with better sacrifices than bulls and goats. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of true things. So he hasn't gone to the tabernacle, he hasn't gone to the temple, he hasn't died for just down here. And the letter to the Hebrews is saying he's died for something much more glorious. His blood sprinkles us and amen, we're holy down here. But, as he goes on in verse 24, Christ has entered not in holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true thing, which are copies of the true things, but Christ has entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters into the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, and just as it appeared for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. And all of that language is there, and you go, so Jesus Christ here, in Hebrews chapter 9, we are being told that the blood of Christ cleanses the heavenly places so that we can enter it. So we're cleansed by it, but heaven's cleansed. You go, how's heaven? Because he is the God-man who, when he took on flesh and came down as a baby, enters back into heaven in a body of human form. And you go, wow, we have a human who is fully God. Now the other side of the firmament, for the first time in human history, who the Father turns around and says, ask of me and I will make the nations yours. And you go, all authority has been given me to me, fellas. Where? In heaven and on earth. Now, get going. <laughs> Amazing. And Ezekiel here, in verse 22, sees these living creatures, and there's an expanse, there's this firmament over them. And again, in Exodus 24, after this purification, where Moses is there reading the law, he sprinkles the blood on the people, he... At, at him, Aaron, his two sons, and 70 others go up the mountainside and they sup and have communion with the Lord and underneath, or above them, but under God's feet, there is this firmament. There's a sea of glass. There's a sea of glass. And Ezekiel here 
is seeing that these heavenly creatures have over them a heavenly expanse. Their wings are stretched out, verse 23, and each creature had two wings covering its body. And when they went, I heard, that, I heard the sound of their wing, wings like the sound of many waters, like the sound of the Almighty, a sound of tumult, like the sound of an army. All this language, all this glorious language, when they stood still, they let down their wings and there came a voice from above the firmament. So again, firmament. God's voice penetrating down through. When they stood still, they let down their wings. And above the expanse, over their heads, there were, again, notice, this is, this is incredible, this verse, 26. Above the firmament, over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne in the appearance of of sapphire or some other jewel or something else and seated above the likeness of a throne so again Ezekiel he's seeing all this madness all this glory firmament God's voice and above the firmament throne and then one like a human is there. You go, hmm. Very interesting. One with a likeness. Whatever that means. <laughs> and upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were gleaming metal like the appearance of fire enclosed all around and downward from the appearance of his waist. I saw as it were the appearance of fire and there was brightness all around him. And then I saw the appearance of the rainbow and in the cloud there it is. And I saw all of this glory and brightness and there I was and I said, oh dear. I saw the glory of the Lord and when I saw this I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. And just we'll just read a few more verses, then we'll go to I'll stop, interrupt, and then we'll go to Revelation. And we won't go any further because of time. And he said to me, Son of man, he said to me, Human, stand on your feet and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking. And within this language, Ezekiel sees all of this. He's flat on his face. And he has the Holy Spirit talking to him, saying, On your feet. And he's like, uh uh. <laughs> and as the, the Lord is speaking to Ezekiel, he is put on his feet by the Lord. He's about to be commissioned to become a prophet. And Ezekiel's like, uh, I'm, a, I'm a priest. <laughs> and God's like, you're a prophet, Ezekiel. And Ezekiel's ministry, Ezekiel's ministry is fascinating. Because Ezekiel's ministry is a prophet about the destruction of Jerusalem, acting out parables. Well, Jesus' ministry is him as a prophet speaking in parables and warning people about the impending coming destruction of Jerusalem so you know you can make the parallels there whatever you wish but before I continue any interruptions or any points or thoughts or <coughs> Yes, that's the last sacrifice once and for all, forever. Yeah, last sacrifice once and for all. Yeah. Just, we'll just look at some nice links here in Ezekiel 1 with um, Revelation 1 and Revelation 4. 
because the links are there, just as we've spoken about, we've spoken about the firmament, we've spoken about this uh, ox, <coughs> this uh, lion, the eagle, the whole concept of what is your Old Testament about, God sets up the priests, God sets up the kings, and then God sends out the prophets. And the pastor was talking about Revelation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some I point I've, I've covered some of it. And but he talks about is it killed then? Yeah, 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 yeah. I forget it too. <coughs> I forget it too. But I can't remember exactly. No, well, let's just start with the 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 end. So go to Revelation one, from verse twelve. <coughs> twelve. You'll stay there, and I will go back to Ezekiel one. We'll stay in Revelation. Yep. I will just read verse 26 of Ezekiel 1, and then we'll read from, from Revelation 1, 12. Above the firmament, expanse, over their heads, there was a throne. And it was beautiful, shining, with sapphire or diamonds or whatever, whatever it means. Seated, was the like, above the likeness of a throne, was a likeness with a human appearance. Okay, there's one with a human appearance. And upward from what he had on his waist had the appearance of gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And downward from what he had, he had the appearance of his waist, and I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire. All of this language, we're not going to turn to the other passage, which is Daniel 7, the Ancient of Days, which is very similar. Mm -hmm. But here we have verse 12, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. I saw the churches, and in the midst of the lampstands, in the midst of the churches, I saw one like a son of man. I saw one like a human. <coughs> Clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest. Priest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. All of this language here, just picking up, John's just picking up again. I saw Christ in glory, and he looks like the Ancient of Days. And he also looks like this guy here, this one in Ezekiel refined in a furnace <clears throat> so just burning bright burning gloriously fiery pure whiter than white and his voice was like the roar of many waters again verse 24 of Ezekiel 1 when these creatures went I heard the sound of their wings like the sound of many waters, like the sound of the Almighty, like the sound of an army. Why is his voice sounding like many waters? Because the Holy Spirit comes from the Father and the Son. And here we see when he speaks, it is speaking as a general, the one in charge, the one who is the Lord of hosts, if you will. In his right hand he held seven stars, pastors, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, his word, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. I just couldn't see it. Notice the parallel. Ezekiel has this vision of glory, falls down. John, when I saw him, I fell at his feet though dead. And John is taken up into the headquarters of heaven, and he sees the glorified Christ, and he's like, oh dear. And he dies, basically. I fell down as though I was dead. And again, notice the intimacy. But he laid his right hand on me and said, Fear not. Just amazing language. I fear not. You've se you are seeing the glorified me. <laughs> you are seeing me glorified in heaven you have no idea how to describe me really and you're saying I'm being you know, I join and being told fear not by the Almighty just amazing I am the first and the last I am the living one and then when you turn over to Revelation chapter 4 
Revelation chapter 4. So we're just, again, you're going to see all the language of Ezekiel 1. Sorry, Ezekiel 4, verse 1. Ezekiel. Sorry, no, Revelation 4. Sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. Yeah, stay in Revelation, stay in Revelation. <laughs> Everyone stay in Revelation. Revelation 4, from verse 1. But all of the language from Ezekiel 1 is, I saw the glory of the Lord, I saw rainbows, I heard this, I heard waters, I'm seeing rainbows, I'm seeing thrones, I see these angelic wheels, I see these angelic beings, I see these wings covering, I see eyes everywhere. I see these living creatures with these funny faces that look like an ox and a lion and an eagle. And then I see the firmament and we're all under it except for God's voice and the throne and the one who looks like a son of man, like a human. And everything else is under the firmament. Well, John here is taken up into the headquarters. John is taken up and he's like, right, time now to show you the other side of the firmament. After this, I looked, verse 1, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, saying, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once, I was in the spirit. And that, again, Ezekiel's terminology, very similar. I was in the spirit. I was picked up and taken over to here. The, Lord, the, the hand of the Lord was upon me. I was picked up and taken over there. And John here is in the spirit, picked up and taken away. And there are four in the spirit scenes. And this is the start of the second one. And behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. So where is he? He's in heaven. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. So all of, basically, there I am and I'm seeing the throne. And it's glorious. And it's got rainbows, it's covenantal, it's peaceful. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments, with golden crowns on their heads. Um, who are they? Well, uh, I think that there is uh, something interesting in your Old Testament, that there seems to be um, spiritual elders in the heavenly realms um, in your Old Testament. clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and pearls of thunder. Oh, that's exactly like Ezekiel. Flashes of lightning, fire. And before the throne was burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. In other words, there's the throne. I'm seeing, what am I seeing? I'm seeing God and the Holy Spirit is present. The Holy Spirit's there present. And before the throne, was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. All of this language here is this idea of we have broken through the firmament. We have gone to the other side. We are there. And when it says, I saw before the throne, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal, apart from it representing the firmament, it also means that before God, Everything is just still. Everything is calm. Everything is restful and peaceful. <coughs> That's what it means. I saw, as it were, a tempest that was actually doing nothing. Because <laughs> it was frozen, if you will. I saw a sea of glass like crystal. And... Before we continue reading, just to make the link here, because this always gets forgotten. Uh, I know I forget it. Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So in other words, pray, 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 pray. And then we get to verse 7. And we all forget verse 7. 
by praying, Paul goes on to say, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. So you come before the throne, you lay your petitions there, you keep praying about it, you keep asking for forgiveness, you keep asking for hope, you keep praying for whatever it is. Because at the throne of God there is no chaos. That's the point. There's no chaos in heaven. And God is not a God of chaos. He is a God of peace. God will hand us over to chaos. I'm not saying he doesn't. He has no problem doing that. What do you guys want? Not you. Fine, get on with it then. <laughs> Romans 1. <clears throat> but here we see that in Revelation 4, John is taken up and he sees all this glory. And in verse 6, there's the throne. There's a sea of glass like crystal. It's a frozen lake, if you will. Frozen tempest. There's not there's no chaos. There's nothing there, just 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 what seems what seems stressful and chaotic to us is just beautiful and peaceful the other side of the tapestry. Just oh okay, you've got this in you know what you're doing, Lord. <laughs> and, and, and that's what John sees. John sees that. Pray, pray, pray. Why? So that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guards your hearts. And then he goes on to say, and around the throne, on each side of the throne, are the, oh, the four living creatures. Uh-oh, we're back to Ezekiel language. Full of eyes in the front and behind. The all-seeing eyes everywhere. The first living creature like a lion. Oh yes, there we are. The second living creature like an ox. And the third living creature with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. Again, all of this language, all of this glory, God's creation, God's glory, God's representatives, God's power. A prophet, priest and king. Prophet, eagle. Priest, ox. Lion, king. Filtered into where? Into man. You are. Adam, you're supposed to be the prophet, priest, and king. You failed us. Well done, Adam. Well done. Where Adam fails, Jesus doesn't. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings and full of eyes all around. Well, again, we read that earlier in Isaiah 6. There I am, Isaiah, lifted up, and behold, there's the seraphim with six wings. <clears throat> full of eyes and they say day and night and they never cease to say holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come and whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to him who is seated on the throne who lives forever and ever the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord, our God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. That language there is funny because it says, They never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy. So that's what they're doing all the time. And then it says, And when the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to him, the 24 elders are on their faces worshipping. And you go, oh, so everyone's praising God in heaven. You go, yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's so beautiful, this language of worship and glory and honour. And, you know, just this concept of here we see the other side, the first time, the other side of the firmament. <coughs> the other side of the firmament. And it is truly glorious, because as we read, and as, as I will reread, there's just those few verses. For 
For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, tabernacles, temples here on earth, but into heaven itself to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. And nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with the blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, Christ has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. And that is the predicament, that is the situation where, where we're in. But a glorious one, that Christ is there, and he comes to take away sin, and he breaks the firmament between heaven and earth. He breaks it because he fulfills everything and he brings heaven and earth together and the Holy Spirit descends. I have all authority where in heaven and on earth go. Be lions, oxes and eagles. Oh, okay. <laughs> go and disciple the nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, of the Son and the Holy Spirit. It is rather incredible to see. It is rather incredible to see. Anything that anyone wishes to add or take away, um, please do. Because how does it end? that be the case I will just end with this one verse <clears throat> talking about glory Ezekiel 1 28 I see everything and then I see the appearance of the rainbow the bow that is in the cloud on the day when it rains I saw everything such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord and when I saw it so what did he see he sees the glory of the Lord. I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. And so you and I, what is our, what is our um, hope? To see the glory of the Lord. And it is the same hope that Moses asked for after all of the plagues, after the parting of the Red Sea, after receiving the the, the, the commandments, he turns around and says, Lord, show me your glory. And the Lord says, you're on, I'll show you my name. And you go, ah. Oh. It's all about worship. When I saw the glory of the Lord, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. And if you and I know Jesus, you and I have the wonderful glory and privilege of knowing that he says the same words that he says to everyone he commissions and he has says the same words that he says to his disciples and to men like John and to women like Mary fear not fear not can I just ask <coughs> oh yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. yeah is it is this relevant to the afterlife, you know, when we die? Is there, is there any relevance to that? Is that the place where we will be? Yeah, the place that you, the place that you go to is to be where God is, and where God is is glory. And I guess the, the, the question is, is, um, is it just in heaven, or is it in a fully consummated new earth here? Well, it's both, and, 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 uh, but the point will be, and here's the real point, um, that those, those who um, are with the Lord in glory, um, what are they doing in terms of time? And we're not going to go on, on, to, on that tangent about time, <laughs> but, but what are they doing? All they're doing, literally, I do mean this, all they are doing wonderfully, is worshiping. 
That is it. That is it. And you won't feel anything but joy because you won't have sin. So there won't be any need for distractions. Mm -hmm. There won't be any need for anxiety. There won't be. Do you know what, Lord? I've been standing up here for a couple of thousand years. My, my knees are hurting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there won't be any of that. Um, you know, my vocal cords, Lord, are just, you know, um, to be in glory with the Lord, the other side of the firmament, means um, that whatever, well, however it looks, we'll just be worshipping, singing, um, praising Him, um, somebody, someone, somewhere, even if it's the Lord Himself, um, will be reading God's Word. And that's it, that's all we'll be doing. And we'll be like, what? I think it is, you know, um, because we live in a fallen world, in fallen bodies, in a sinful world, I, and the limitations of our mind, I, I truly believe we can't and won't be able to mm. fully comprehend it no, no, until no. we are there. I, mm -hmm. I don't think we can truly <clears throat> imagine it. Yeah. You know, the, we have, you, you see in the writers, in John, in Ezekiel, that they're really, as much as they've written a book about it, they're equally kind of lost for words. They're yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Well, how do I describe yeah. this? Well, okay, I'll say it's like. It's like, yeah. And it's like, but they've never seen yeah. what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. they couldn't, they've never even imagined what they're yeah. seeing. And, and, yeah. and so we are, you know, it's not that we shouldn't discuss it, we shouldn't read it, and we shouldn't think on it. I, I think, it, yeah, you know, yeah, Paul says, we will know we will know fully as we have been yeah. fully known. Yeah. Uh, for now we see in a mirror dimly, and I think mm -hmm. it's so true yeah. that we mm -hmm. we use our limited understanding to say, okay, it'll be like this, we'll feel like that. Yeah. I, I don't think we'll ever... No, no, no. Until no, we get there, the, like you said, Matthew, the, we feel joy in this <coughs> life at times, you know, we, through, through laughter, through love. We have glimpses yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it. We have, glimpses. yeah, you know, through is that, love and is whatnot. Is that mirror dimly? You yeah. kind of, that broken glass, you see your reflection. Yeah. But it's kind of like, oh, because it's broke, it, you know, it's that, it's that kind of glass that we have on those bottom panels over there where it's mm. marbly. Mm. So you kind of go, I sort of can see something. God, do I have? Six eyes, you know. But this is uh, it. Like, so the human mind always wants to put a, a physical body. That's to right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, is he? Is he black? Is he white? Is he? Yeah. Does he look like this? You know, is he? Has he got hair? Has he got long hair? Is it white? Yeah. Is it this? Is it? Yeah. And you're like, well, the Bible says God is love. So if you can try and imagine yeah. looking on pure yeah. love. Pure brilliance is, is and I no, think no, it's no, right. really John, incredible. John turns around and says that line where it's like he's before Christ and he says, I saw his face <coughs> and it was shining like, like the, the sun. Full and shining and, of the sun. And you go, Right, so so how far away am I from the sun? Yeah. I look up and I go, oh, how far away were you from? It was just blinded. And you yeah. go, so what did you see? I just was blinded. <laughs> just, yeah. So well, yeah, but what did you see? <laughs> well, I was blinded, guys. And you and you're right. It, it, ultimately, whatever it is, it's just. You, when I say just, I don't mean it in the negative. I mean it in the sense of it will be no more stress, no more pain, yeah. no more no more tears, and it will be just pure worship where everything is. Um, glorified and transformed. So my awful singing, for example, will actually might sound half decent, you mm -hmm. know? Um, well, I right. disagree with yeah. that, because you're saying everything, that everything you're talking about <laughs> is time-based. It's time-based, yeah, yeah. We are going to eternity, so we have yeah, no yeah. clue about what eternity, I mean, no, no, as you not, told no. us, all the stuff we're reading about singing and stuff has happened. That's, yeah, that's yeah, occurred, yeah. that's been done. So when we go, <coughs> Yeah, you know, when we try and understand what heaven could be like, yeah. we can never be right. No, no, because no, that's right. We, no, no. we have no, absolutely no understanding of what it is to be. You know, when we worship, when we're with God, we will be, we will be with God. We don't need to worship because 
we will be connected with God. We will. Be, oh yeah. But we well, will, yeah, yeah. But I think be, I think there'll be a worship in terms. Because otherwise, of, it sounds incredibly boring. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, yeah. That's an argument that people say. But, so but, 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 but I know that that's not going to happen. But I think that yeah. But I think it is that thing where it says in, in, at the end of Revelation four, where it says the twenty-four elders are there, and then the seraphim are there, and every time the seraphim say holy, 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 which is all the time, the twenty-four elders are bowing down, worshiping. And so, so, so you realise that it is, it is going to be um, whatever, whatever the worship is. And I think that's the point. I think it's like trying to say, the word worships there, so we'll be worshiping. What does it look like? Perpetual mm. state of utter bliss. I, I, yeah, 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 I agree. Yeah, that's yeah. What oh, I think. Right. Whatever, it's whatever a it looks like. Perpetual state of utter bliss. Whatever it looks like, mm. it's just joy, just <clears> bliss, <throat> just peace, just, just. Um, just the, and and the, and I think the the key to underpinning it is just the op- the whole section opens with um, just do not fear, John. Mm-hmm. And so you so you're there before this glorified Christ, the Ancient of Days, and you go, and all he's saying is do not fear, everyone. You're here, and then you go through the book of worthy are you to be slain, and all those good things, and so. I can yeah. um, remember seeing a, an interview of a lady who really, I suppose, probably um, was so close to death that she more or less did die, but was, you know, uh, sent back, really. I really? suppose that's what they say, isn't it? But I'm sure there's a better way of saying it than that. Mm-hmm. And um, she saw colours, and you, you sort of think, well, you know, colours are finite to a degree, as far as we're concerned. There are only so many colours, even though there are thousands, because you can, you know, grade. And she, she said, I, I wouldn't even start to describe them because they are, they are literally indescribable. So I can't, I wouldn't even bother trying. And you think, how can that be? Because colours are what they are, but, you know, that's it, isn't it? We, we just don't know. We, mm-hmm. we just can't say. Yeah, I think you can get a, a kind of sense of, although you, you know, we can't visualize, no. but we can, I, I don't know, I feel I get a sense from when we read, you know, when we read those, the, these pictures, descriptions, you just get a sense of the kind of immensity mm. And uh, the depth of the experience will make it something that you would never get bored with Mm. because it has such immensity, such, Mm. um, you can't describe it, but you can feel it. I I kind of feel that I I can feel this. yeah, this feeling of. Uh, I think I think Darren said it to sum it up. Where it's just that that mirror dimly. It's like so this side of this side of life, we do get those those moments of feelings, those moments of thought, which are super just you can't describe them, mm-hmm. but they fade because they're dim. Yeah, they I don't mean, last. I had. Um, uh, I had an experience when I was going through a traumatic time, getting divorced and stuff, and I had an experience, same experience twice, where God showed me my young self, I'm talking toddler young, you know, mm. and I was kind of transported back to not the physical sense of being little, but in an emotional sense of your kind of pure self, who you are, your personality, how loving you are and how innocent you are as a child Mm. and and all of those facets of your own personality that God gave to you that were not moulded by trauma and damage and Mm. all of the different parts of life and God was showing me this is who you are, this is who I created you to be, this is that that's down, mm. and then you now carry mm. baggage and mm. personality traits that are 
developed through life because that's <coughs> who I made you to be. And God showed me that at two different times to remind me of it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a, it kind of relates in the same way that he was showing me to kind of know myself to you're not defined by these things that happen to you. And, yeah. and I think it's just yeah. a magnified billion times version of that. When you go to heaven, yeah. God will show you this is who you are. Yeah. This is who I made you to be. Yeah. Yeah. You're perfect to me. You're my perfect son. You're my perfect daughter. Yeah. And all of the... Yeah, the, the the physical body will be gone. As you say, we won't have an aching back and legs because we've been stood up for two hours and, yeah. and you know, and your traumatic experiences in life will be wiped away. Mm-hmm. And what will be left is creation of you. I think, you yeah, that brings up a picture for me of a, of a baby. Yeah. And babies can be so tranquil, can't they? So, yeah. so at ease with themselves and with the world. Yeah. Because they... I, I truly they believe you, that they know God more closely yeah. than they ever will for the rest well, of their life. I do as well, but, you know, the idea of that innocence and yeah. that, that, that just being in the world. And that's how we should have remained. You know, that was God's design. And we, you, we shouldn't worry about getting mugged late at night. We shouldn't worry about locking mm-hmm. the door. These things shouldn't exist. You know, human mm-hmm. sin brought this. Mm-hmm. But there's, there's a sense also in, in babies of, of um, one, wonderment mm-hmm. and also of trust. Yeah, absolutely. They don't, they don't fear anything. No. Know, as long as their needs are met physically. Yeah. Because, okay, we could say babies cry and, you know, they get upset. That's because their, they, their physical needs uh, aren't met. And yeah. once you, f- you know, you see a baby that's been fed and, it, and they just look, you know, so yeah, peaceful, like you they have, beautiful, they have tr- complete trust and, and yeah. innocence at that point in the world. And that's the kind of feeling you get, isn't it, from this... Yeah. Uh, from that description, just completely, completely safe. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. um, we will be in, we will be in the arms of our true father. <coughs> yeah, who will never disappoint. Who will never, you know, yeah, fail. His word will stand forever, as the, as the Bible yeah. says. You know, this world will disappear. The, the sky will be rolled up like a scroll, but the word will stand. But that, you know, that feeling of being like a child, like a baby, is still there inside of us. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. It's still there. Yeah. And if we can access that, yeah, we, we can experience that, can't we? Again? Yeah. I, it's yeah. not easy, though. I, I don't know. No. <laughs> No, it's the innocence and that just just the joy of it, you know, of being alive, of being Well what what we have to do as adults is try to consciously reconnect with that actually. Um, yeah. You know, and because it it can positively affect how we interact with the world, with each other, yes. the amount of patience and love we have towards each other that, that yeah. Jesus would want us to have. You know? If yeah. we you know what does Jesus say? You know, be as one of these. <laughs> and you maybe know. you know, maybe the idea of being born again, you know, in a sense, is 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 trying to get back to that um, spiritual um, perfection. Is yeah, what we strive not, for. That's right. It's not to be immature as a person, but it's to have that spirit. Of, of love and, and patience that a child has, the forgiveness mm. that a child has. You know, how quickly does a child forget? Whereas adults, we hold on to things and our grievances and our our pride has been hurt. You yeah. know, we all do it. Yeah. I'm terrible for it. And, you know, so you could learn a lot from that, can't we? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mm. that's really really interesting. Well, with that bombshell and time person, <coughs> let's just close in prayer and do pray if you feel led to. Dear Heavenly Father, we 
we think on these things of how, Lord, we plead for your Spirit to help us to be childlike but not childish. Mm -hmm. We pray, Lord, for wisdom in how to navigate that, Lord, mm -hmm. and how to trust you and to know that you have us in your arms and that, Lord, when we go through dark valleys, when we go through the peaks of life, when we go down into the darkness of life, Lord, that you are there. You are always there. Your rod and your staff, they are there comforting us. And Father, we ask that you will help us to, um, as has been said, to see the glory of you, the glory of your name, to see how righteous thou art. And we thank thee, Lord, that you came down as a baby, that you broke through the firmament, to save us. And we thank the Heavenly Father that Jesus Christ died on a cross, that His blood cleanses us now, we are holy now by Him. But Father, we can enter paradise for eternity because it is cleansed by Him. We thank You for Your Son, Lord. We thank Thee for the angelic host, the army that is all around who worships thee day and night, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy. And Lord, we pray that you will give us that heart to come to you to say, we thank thee, Lord, that you are Holy, Holy, Holy. <clears throat> so, dear Heavenly Father, we thank thee for tonight. We thank thee, Lord, that we are not left alone, but you come down and you seek to sup with each one of us, that you knock on the heart. And Lord, we pray that we will open the door. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee, and we ask, Lord, by Your Spirit, that You will teach us to pray, and teach us, Lord, to come before Your throne, to give every petition to You, every plea before You, every prayer before You. And we thank Thee, Lord, that what seems chaos to us is but a mere frozen tempest at Your throne. There is no chaos, Lord. We thank Thee that there is just peace and love and covenant and holiness. And we ask, Lord, as that verse says, that by coming to You, You will teach us that Your love, Your grace, Your peace is given to us that surpasses all understanding. So we ask, Heavenly Father, that You will bless us now as we pray. Bless anyone here, Lord, who wishes to pray and get us home safely, we pray. In Jesus' name.